What is up, Janksters? It's your boy, Graham, also known as HamHox42 on the internet. And today we have some early looks at Lord of the Rings, actually. Uh, the Lord of the Rings upcoming set that's going to be released in June. Now, we were aware that it was coming. We've seen some art for it. And Wizards has uh, let us in on a couple of cards that are going to be printed. And I want to talk about one specifically today because it's kind of the big one. And that is the One Ring. They are doing it. Here it is. Now, they have talked about... or. The community has talked about how cool it would be for the One Ring to be a reskin of Soul Ring. And yes, it's like, it's right there. It's very clear. It's a super powerful card. Everybody loves it. It's very, very good, obviously. It's a ring. It would make sense. But that's not what this is. And I think that's for the best because this format or this this um, set is going to be modern legal. Now, commander players everywhere, we all know Soul Ring. We go up against it all the time. We probably have a dozen of them ourselves, whatever the case may be. But in modern, uh, Soul Ring is not legal. And if they printed Soul Ring into a modern legal format, they would probably have to pre-ban it, and that's always awkward. You don't want to print something that is too good. You have to get it. You have to ban it. So rather than do that, they've created their own version of the One Ring. And honestly, flavorfully, I think it's pretty solid. So let's get into it. What does it do? It is a legendary artifact called the One Ring for four. It has indestructible. Pretty pretty fitting, I think. When the One Ring enters the battlefield, if you cast it, you gain protection from everything until your next turn. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life for each burden counter on the One Ring. And you can tap, put a burden counter on the One Ring, then draw a card for each burden counter on the One Ring. So this has a lot of cool play. I really dig it. I mean, a four mana artifact that just says tap, draw a card is amazing. Now you do have to lose some life later on, but the more you use it, the more cards you draw. So if you end up with three, four counters on this, this is just tap, draw three or four cards. What? Like, <laughs> that's insane. Um, yeah, th this card is bananas crazy. And on top of that, when you cast it, you get the protection from everything until your next turn, which well, it, when it ETBs, assuming you cast it, you do get that protection, which is meaningful. And it kind of makes sense. So from a flavorful perspective, you know, what does the one ring do? You know, that's actually that's kind of a question that, you know, fans of the of the books and the films kind of ask themselves. And well, there's one very clear ability that it has one very clear power that it contains and that is the ability to turn the wearer invisible that's something that we see all the time uh you know Gollum's done it Bilbo's done it Frodo's done it Sam's even done it in the books oh, spoiler warning I guess anyway <laughs> um I don't think he ever did it in the movie but definitely did it in the books anyway no he did it anyway it doesn't matter um <laughs> so when the wearer puts the ring on they go invisible so the idea of that being you know okay I've played this spell I have possession of the ring and now I have protection from everything you can't see me, you can't target me, you can't hurt me anymore. Poof, I've disappeared, I'm gone. That actually is kind of cool. Like, flavorfully, makes sense, I dig it. Uh, and then, the other thing that we've seen it do is wear away at the resolve and the willpower of the wielder, whoever is carrying the ring for an extended period of time, it hurts them. So the burden counter makes sense. You know, the idea that, okay, I have this thing, it's eating me away, it's gonna slowly drain my life, and the more I wear it, the more I use it, the more I turn to it for power, the more it corrupts me and the more it hurts me. So that being kind of cumulative life loss makes a lot of sense. Like, I like that a lot. Now, there are some interesting uh, plays with this that make it not so bad. Like, not, not so bad at all. So... I've noticed it as indestructible, which also makes sense from a flavor perspective because the the ring be, you know being destroyed is kind of the whole conflict of the of a you know the epic trilogy, right? So yeah, it's difficult to break, difficult to destroy. That of course makes perfect sense. Uh, the thing that it doesn't have on it though that I think it should is it does not have text that says this cannot be sacrificed. It also doesn't have shroud, which I think it really should because. At, at the end of the day, like, the problem that the Fellowship faced, the f problem that Frodo ultimately had, was they couldn't reasonably get rid of it. They couldn't just throw it away. They couldn't just destroy it. They had, or, you know, they, you know, Gimli tries to crash it with his axe in the film, which I thought was a brilliant way to just show how indestructible this thing was. That all makes sense. The problem is, there's nothing stopping you from sacrificing this to an Oni cult anvil. 
don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure the Oni Cult Anvil is not uh, representative of the fires of Mount Doom. So the fact that I can just throw the ring away whenever I'm done with it, like, all right, cool. I've drawn five cards off this thing. I'm just going to go ahead and... I'm just gonna throw it away before it kills me. That's very easy to do with this build, or with, with, with the way that this card is designed. And I think it's kind of a bummer. The other thing you can do is just blink it. Because if you, if you just blink it, you just reset the, the counters. You could also use effects like Glissa to remove counters from it. Like that's not hard to do. So just remove the burden counters. And all of a sudden, like you just, you're back to having an artifact that just says tap, draw a card. It also doesn't come into play with any burden counters on it. So if you just play it and you don't use it to draw a card, you don't get hurt on your upkeep. So if you're going up against a bl like a blitz blisteringly fast red deck, for example, maybe you don't want to be drawing cards off it. You know, there's a point where you'll have to, but I think, uh, I don't know. It, you, you know, you can choose to, depending on the deck that you're going up against, uh, de depending on the match you're in, you can choose whether or not to, to leverage it. You know, if your life total is precious in that particular match, uh, then don't don't activate it. Just, just play it, prevent a turn from getting burnt, and then on the turn you're going to try to go for the kill, then sure, you can tap and draw one extra card and get another resource, maybe, but, you know, you don't have to make a big deal about it. You know, other matches where you're getting... Um, you know, where you're in a situation where you're going up against a control player who is trying to win on card advantage, this just says no. Like, if you're not threatening my life total and I can burn some of it to just draw a, just a crazy number of cards, I can and I'm going to. And that's pretty awesome. So I think this card is actually brilliantly designed. It is the appropriate mix of being really, really powerful while also being relatively expensive. Four mana is not cheap. So that is something to take it to something to keep in mind. Um, and on the turn you draw it, I mean, the protection from everything might be relevant depending on what, I mean, if you, I'm thinking, okay, this isn't going to be standard legal, but I'm thinking if you see an invoke despair coming, getting protection from everything means that they can't target you with an invoke despair. So you effectively like proactively counter that spell. So that's kind of neat. Also, if your opponent's like trying to pop off with arcane bombardment and they have a bunch of like direct damage or a bunch of creatures online that they're gonna try to hurt you with, this buys you a turn. You know, it, there are a lot of situations where just playing this is gonna buy you a turn. That's pretty cool. Like, I think that's worth it in a lot of situations. Yeah, but I definitely want this in Commander as a card draw engine. Like in Commander, I'm putting burden counters on this all day. I don't care. Tap, draw three cards. Oh yeah, ring, burn me. Let's go. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm into it. I think this is great. I think this is a really cool card. I do wish they had added some kind of thing where it couldn't be sacrificed. I think that also flavorfully would have made sense because, you know, throwing this into your first anvil is definitely different from... You know, we're hitting this with a gleeful... Well, you can't hit it with a gleeful demolition. That one says destroy. Hmm. Anyway. In any event. I like the card. I think it's very, very cool. And, I mean, honestly, this is the Lord of the Rings set. If the ring wasn't good, we'd have a problem. And, and I think this is a cool ring, and I'm glad we get to see it. So, yeah, there are going to be more spoilers coming. Uh, I'll definitely plan on talking about those here on this show, which is the Overthinking MTG podcast. So thank you so much for, for tuning in. Thank you for checking it out, whether you're on YouTube or on your podcast app of choice. I appreciate you, and I'll catch you on the next one.